Ok, maintenant je voudrais donner la parole à, à Geneviève. Je vais donner la parole à Geneviève Zarate. Qui est Let me speak, please. Leave me the microphone. So, Geneviève is a professor at the National Institute of Oriental Languages and Civilization. So, you're going to whet our appetites and by telling us what you think of this study. Yes, maybe I'll be uh, putting a bit of uh, vinegar into uh, the whole debate. No. I am meant to reply to f these five questions, right? So I'll cover those. This report talks about translation, but they're all different types of utilization of translation or definitions of translation. And by just using one term, a translation, you're concealing a whole variety of possible types of translation. But all in all, I would tend to agree with what Mr. Kona just said. You might even query the definition of a language. Because there's no clear-cut definition as to what a language is. I'll give you three options, and of these three definitions, the notion of translation is quite different, depending on the context. Language is a, uh, is a system described by its morphology, its syntax, its uh, spelling, uh, or a language is a means of communication, or language is a means of social communication. And it's under that last definition that I would like to take this forward. I'm not refuting the first two uh, options, however. When we talk about translation from the national point of view, we are overlooking the diversity of practices which exist within this notion in any given country. France may seem to be a country which doesn't teach languages particularly well, but there is a whole variety of practices depending on the teacher training or the institutions offering continuous training. And this diversity is reflected in the way translation is used. Every country has its own educational tradition based on language policy. But behind that, there are also educational cultures which are very different. China, I think, was touched upon in your report uh, as a way of comparing uh, their situation to against our European practices. And that's a good example because from the point of view of China, our practices, our vision of teaching languages and the pedagogical credos we have, uh, they are homogeneous in Europe from the Chinese point of view. Translation lies at the very heart of pedagogical activity in language teaching in China. Any Chinese student has his or her electronic dictionary, which he will fiddle around with immediately, which is not disruptive in class. And a foreign language is Chinese teacher. Uh, has an immediate translation in class. Otherwise, uh, I mean, why is he getting paid? So the, the sort of debate we're having here is a debate which also has to be analysed from the educational culture angle. Uh, and that covers translation too. The downside of translation in class is when translation is for one sole purpose, namely to evaluate pupil skills. Because uh, that's based on a, a deficit-based approach to the pupil. This morning, there was a very technical, leading-edge 
expert debate about error which awaits. But if you're looking at translation from a school-based point of view, error, mistakes, lie still at the very heart of the whole process. So it's a deficit-based approach to the pupil. But for me, translation is ambiguous, particularly when it's compressed into just one definition. And it encourages a rather naive view of the relationship between languages. By naive view, I mean when our pupils, when the environment doesn't fully master another language, then it's a relationship from which the pupil is excluded because skills being delegated to somebody else without having the power to intervene. There was another report uh, uh, published as well, which said that translation is invisible in the eyes of the European citizen, which is a bit of a shame because translation conceals uh, power in a way. A mediator is somebody who is regulating the vision and the taking ownership of communication, which is essential. So what I would say is that we shouldn't delegate to one skilled person such a sensitive operation, but as part of general training, which our educational systems are meant to provide, we should be trying to make that sure that our pupils are people who can intervene and can play a part in the delegation of power and take over ownership to a certain extent so that they have a share in the whole process rather than saying okay you know all about it you go and do the translation so that's my understanding of the term mediator Translation isn't a, a, an end a result to be achieved. It's a process where ownership is at stake because we're talking about controlling meaning and the meaning of a communication has to be a shared meaning rather than an imposed meaning by one party only. You asked for an example of successful utilizations of mediation and I can give you one. Which is, it's a European example. The Franco-German Youth Office focused on this. It's an office that was set up after three uh, wars between neighbouring countries, France and Germany. And it's this historical stamp on it which really... Uh, influence the whole process and this doesn't just concern bilingual experts and indeed the language of the other side wasn't required for there to be Franco-German exchanges and so this was a, 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 a robust, a strong innovation because yes these meetings were under the aegis of a certain theme, women, ecology, what have you, but these meetings were organised in order to make sure that groups met each other, different national groups, French and German, but they knew how communication should be organized within the, this framework and how they were actually uh, obstructed by national allegiances. And uh, within the Franco-German context, this is something which became clear after a while, and a, a, a group dynamic emerged. And it's true that the translator in, well, the translators in charge of translation in such a group where the participants didn't necessarily understand the other side's language became polarized, as if you like, and almost a, a lightning conductor f for the lightning of misunderstanding, and thereby triggering... Uh, 
the clearing up of misunderstandings. So I'll leave it there because I know time's short. But this was a, a form of for experimentation, genuine, a genuine communications laboratory where time was taken because the time is a key element here. You take the time to look at how communications proceed in circumstances where at some stages you have to go via a translator. Maybe you're familiar with César, the sculptor known for crushing major volumes and compressing them into very small volumes, thereby totally deforming the object. Normal communications via a translator uh, is a sort of compression, but laboratories such uh, as the one I've described help to decompress the object and showing all the various strata involved in a communication, which is uh, very complex. And this return to complexity is something which I think should be one of the key objectives of our thinking on communications in language classrooms.